So I'm Rup Chakraborty, one of the core organizers of this uh, meeting on genome architecture and function. Uh, this meeting was supposed to be held in person at these during these dates at MIT, but for obvious reasons that was not possible. So what we decided to do was to move the in-person meeting to sometime in the spring or summer of 2021. But rather than just cancel this meeting, we thought we would have double the fun, and therefore many speakers who could not accept our invitation earlier uh, have kindly agreed to speak. And also importantly, many junior scientists who would have otherwise not gotten to speak will speak during these next three and a half days. So we're very excited about this. And now for a formal welcome on behalf of the core organizers and MIT, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Phil Sharp. Uh, this meeting is on genome architecture and function. And Phil has made many seminal contributions to this field, most famously the discovery of RNA splicing, which was recognized with the Nobel Prize. And Phil is also a uh, institute professor at MIT, and so he's an appropriate person to offer some words of formal welcome. Phil? Uh, thank you, Arup. Uh, good morning. It's a real uh, honor to have uh, this symposium at MIT and to host it virtually. Uh, I would much prefer it be in person so I could meet each of you, but uh, that is impossible. I also want to welcome the participants and speakers to this exciting virtual meeting. The speakers in this workshop are investigating some of the most innovative topics in biology, many with a direct implication for biomedical science. An exciting, unusual aspect of this meeting is the important mixture of physics and biology. This has been rare over the past several decades, but recall that the collaboration of physicists and biologists were the source of molecular biology. At MIT, we think of this uh, in the context of Salvador Luria, who was a biologist interested in the genetic nature of a gene, and Max Delbroek, who was a physicist who was interested in the material properties of a gene. And that collaboration gave rise to much of what we know today to be molecular biology and is a background for this particular meeting. This meeting is a harbinger, in my opinion, of future, of the future, where physics engineer, physical scientists, computational scientists will directly collaborate with life scientists to advance our understanding fundamental knowledge, as well as to overcome many of society's most important challenges, such as health, environment, or food. This has been called convergence, and it's something that NSF has embraced very strongly. This workshop is a convergence of physics, as I said, with the cell biology and investigation in the structure and function of the nucleus. The field is undergoing many major transitions with new concepts and technologies that are driving the science forward. And I look forward to hearing about this exciting science here at the meeting. We are transitioning, in my opinion, in the context of this and several other uh, meetings and advances at this time from viewing a static nature of cell biology to viewing a much richer and dynamic integrated view of cell biology and particularly the nucleus. I close by thanking all the speakers who've made themselves available and it's uh, quite an exciting list and the audience for their participation and at which reach each of you wish each of you the best in this time of COVID. I, I look forward to listening and being part of the symposium. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, uh, let me now um, say that this meeting 
would not be possible without the support of the National Science Foundation. And in particular, the champion of this meeting, uh, Krastan Blagoev from the National Science Foundation. So Krastan, would you uh, kindly say a few words of welcome to the participants? Sure. Um, 20 years ago, I, when I was uh, doing theoretical physics in condensed matter physics, I was told that 21st century will be the century of biology. And I'm so glad that 20 years later into the century, we can see that this is the century of biology and physics. Physics has entered a new era in which physical life sciences are the new frontier for physics. And it's a privilege for me. I was not born when uh, Delbruck and Loria made this, their discoveries or Francis Crick and Watson. But I think in the past decade, we are living a new renaissance in this collaboration between physics and biology in which, as Phil said, we are studying the dynamics and the time dependence of, of biological process or physical process in biology. And I think the next 80 years, we will actually have an amazing collaboration and a new science will emerge uh, be between physics and biology. I would like to speak for all of my colleagues from NSF that I work with in this area, and we are all excited about what's happening. And uh, I hope that we have a wonderful workshop and we will continue next year. And I hope that we will, this will be an annual event to celebrate and to uh, discuss our results in this amazingly exciting area. Thank you so much, Arup. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank you everyone who is attending and I wish you a very, very successful workshop. Thank you, Krasan, very much. It's a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this conference. It's uh, who is Michael Rosen from the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. Uh, Mike has been one of the leaders of an exciting aspect of cell biology, which is the role of phase separated bodies in, cellular, in determining cellular function. And today he's going to tell us about organization of chromatin by intrinsic and regulated phase separation. Well, I'd like to uh, begin by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity uh, to participate uh, in this workshop on genome architecture and dynamics, um, and in particular to have the opportunity to, uh, to provide the keynote lecture uh, to get us all started here. Um, and the work I'm going to talk about today uh, will focus on the work that my lab has done uh, very recently uh, to try to understand chromatin through the lens of liquid-liquid uh, phase separation. And, and I got to be honest, um, this really feels a bit to me like bringing the coals to Newcastle. Um, you know, my entire scientific career, I have studiously avoided the nucleus. I have studiously avoided DNA. Um, most of my, my research over, over the years has, has focused on signaling pathways, in particular those that control the actin cytoskeleton. Uh, so this is really a very, very new area of uh, uh, both conceptually and technically for, for me and my lab. Um, you know, but I hope I can uh, provide some uh, information and show some data that will um, at least be provocative and uh, perhaps will set up some of the, the themes and ideas um, that we're going to see discussed uh, through the rest of the workshop. So uh, work in my lab for about 10 years now has focused on understanding um, the formation and regulation and function of eukaryotic cell compartments uh, that we term biomolecular condensates. Um, these are, by definition, uh, compartments in eukaryotic cells that concentrate selected groups of macromolecules, proteins, nucleic acid, probably small molecules as well, but in the absence of a uh, surrounding encapsulating membrane. Um, there are 3D condensates that are found in the cytoplasm and the nucleoplasm of cells. There are also membrane-associated condensates found in various membranes, uh, again, throughout the cell. Uh, an important characteristic of condensates is that they exchange their components rapidly with the surrounding cytoplasm and nucleoplasm, but nevertheless maintain distinct compositions with uh, different functions. Uh, condensates are found really in, in a, a huge diversity of biological processes, especially now as more people are, are looking at them. 
Um, everything from um, signaling clusters uh, at membranes, which my lab has worked on. Um, there's many aspects of RNA metabolism and RNA biochemistry in the cell that is mediated by condensates. And then, uh, again, the focus of, of uh, much of the work uh, going to be discussed at the workshop, um, there are many nuclear processes also um, uh, that, that basically go through condensates, for example, repair of DNA damage, and as I'm sure we're going to hear later, um, uh, gene uh, expression processes. Um, condensates also function across a wide range of length scales, and this is something that my lab has begun to think about more and more. Um, you know, condensates can both control the biochemistry of individual molecules, but they can also uh, act on a more meso scale to control a large organization of cellular structures. For example, holding the ends of DNA proximal um, during DNA uh, repair processes. They can also act on the, on the entire length scale of the cell, integrating cellular information um, uh, to, to switch between different cellular states. And so there's a lot of interesting functionality across those different scales. Now, a, a really key concept um, that that's, um, has emerged uh, over the years is that many of these structures appear to form through the physical process of liquid-liquid of phase separation. And we will hear, uh, I know a lot about that, uh, from many of the different uh, speakers uh, uh, throughout the workshop. Now, <clears throat> my lab has sort of come to this through, through the, the standpoint of molecular mechanism. And one of the uh, uh, important ideas that has emerged uh, again over the years from my lab and a number of labs is that this process of phase separation in biology is driven largely by weak multivalent interactions. And this, this comes straight from concepts, uh, age-old concepts in polymer chemistry dating back to the, the early part of the 20th century, um, where polymer chemists showed that multivalent interactions can drive molecular assembly, in that case polymer assembly, which then inherently decreases the solubility of molecules, driving phase separation. In biology, there are many different instantiations of phase separation that have been shown over the, over the last decade. Um, there are a number of cases where multi-domain proteins that contain strings of modular binding elements uh, connected by flexible tethers um, uh, can, can drive macromolecular phase separation. We've done work on signaling molecules that control the active site skeleton. Um, uh, there's a wonderful set of papers from Minji Zhang's lab who has looked at the postsynaptic density, for example. Um, there's also many, many examples that have been studied in the literature of intrinsically disordered regions of proteins undergoing assembly and concomitant phase separation. Um, and those essentially are weakly adhesive elements scattered across a disordered polypeptide chain. So analogous to multi-domain proteins, but with different kinds and much smaller adhesive elements. And those adhesive elements can be things like cation pi interactions here or charge-charge interactions. They can also be manifest, as my colleague Steve McKnight at Southwestern has shown, um, uh, beta strand-like interactions. Um, this is not something that's limited to proteins at all. Um, repetitive base pairing elements in both RNA and DNA uh, can drive assembly and phase separation. Um, a very important point that I'm going to come back to in the context of chromatin is, is that, again, from polymer chemistry, these ideas of assembly and phase separation are, are scale independent. Uh, they don't depend on the size of the or the nature of the interactions. A good example of that is in um, a paper from Pietro di Camilli's lab where he showed that synaptic vesicles, which are way, way, way bigger, obviously, than, than any of these molecules shown here, if you coat them with multiple adhesive elements will assemble and phase separate to form basically a fluid, phase separated fluid, whose basic unit uh, is a vesicle. And again, I'll come back to that idea in a moment. Now, again, these ideas from polymer chemistry that have shaped our thinking about, about macromolecular assemblies and phase separation naturally lead to modes of regulation because one of the things the polymer chemist told us is that, that higher valence of interactions and higher affinity promote oligomerization and thus also uh, increase the driving force for phase separation. And this can be manifest in, in multiple different ways. Um, one of the things we've looked at in my lab is the, is the interaction of multi-domain proteins um, that have multiple SH3 domains with ligands that contain multiple proline-rich motifs. Um, in a particular case, we have three SH3s and nine binding sites. Um, 
those will phase separate, but one needs fairly high concentrations to do so. If, however, you array those molecules on, on a protein scaffold through other kinds of interactions, now the valence jumps from 3 plus 9 to 9 plus 9. The, the phase boundary shifts in the phase diagram. So the same concentrations over here that were in the one phase regime of a phase diagram now are in the two phase regime and the system phase separate. Um, there are a number of different covalent modifications that have been shown to either strengthen or weaken interactions, particularly in, in IDRs, that again, either can promote or, or uh, uh, diminish uh, the drive to phase separate. So with those uh, ideas in mind, um, I want to tell you about the, this, again, very new direction that we've moved to uh, in my lab um, involving uh, chromatin regulation, or chromatin organization, rather. Um, and this is uh, a topic that I suspect uh, many, many people here at the workshop are quite familiar with. And the basic problem, uh, as I see it coming in from the outside, is, is, is this idea of compaction, that every uh, nucleated human, human cell has approximately two meters of DNA in it, but somehow that DNA has to get compacted into this much, much, much smaller, roughly 10, diameter, 10 micron diameter nucleus. And it must get compacted in a way that yet retains dynamics in order to permit regulation and function. And moreover, it must do so in a way that creates functional domains. And these can be of different uh, sizes, kilobase to, to megabase scales. And this organization, compaction, organization into domains, um, controls many, many different nuclear processes, everything including transcription, replication, DNA repair. Uh, it goes awry in, in many different kinds of diseases. Now, the organization, if you look at, at textbooks, has traditionally been explained through some kind of hierarchical assembly, and sort of the basic idea is illustrated here. And that is one starts with this very long chain of DNA, and there's an initial compaction uh, into uh, nucleosomes, uh, which, uh, which wrap to, uh, twice around, uh, the DNA wraps twice around uh, a histone octomer uh, to create the nucleosome structure, those nucleosomes then assemble into what's been called the 30 nanometer fiber, which is a, a structurally discrete um, uh, assembly uh, involving stacking of the nucleosomes on one another. Then the idea is that those fibers get assembled into larger fibers, which themselves get assembled to even larger fibers, and eventually one can end up with something as compact as, say, the mitotic chromosome. Now, the problem as people have, have begun to develop more and more sophisticated cellular imaging is that there just doesn't appear to be widespread observation of these fibrous structures in eukaryotic nuclei in, in most cases. And so I think it's fair to say that the, this, the organizational intermediate between nucleosomes, which very clearly exist in nuclei, and um, uh, you know, these much, much, much larger structures of chromosomes um, remains uh, quite poorly understood. Now, there have been a number of recent studies that have invoked phase separation in controlling nuclear structure and nuclear function. Um, uh, the first of these were a couple of papers from the Narlikar and Carpin labs um, who showed that uh, HP1 alpha, which is a key uh, a protein component uh, marker of, of or driver of heterochromatin, um, can undergo liquid-liquid phase separation on its own and recruit DNA into those phase-separated structures. And so both labs uh, then hypothesized that this phase separation may play a key role in, in forming heterochromatin. Uh, there's been uh, a number of work, uh, again, from folks who are going to be speaking uh, at, at the workshop uh, this week um, <clears throat> uh, uh, on the role of phase separation or at least macromolecular assemblies through analogous interactions in transcription. And, and the CISA, Sharp, and Young uh, collaboration has, has suggested that these may underlie phase separation of transcriptional, uh, various transcription factors may underlie formation of uh, super enhancers. Um, a slightly different take has come out of the Darjak uh, and Tijan, Tijan labs, um, where, where they argue, uh, nevertheless, that, that multivalent interactions between transcription factors can produce assemblies um, uh, that on small scale uh, may be related to phase-separated structures and on large scale do form phase-separated structures. Um, and again, we'll hear more about that uh, this week. Um, in all of these cases, though, uh, essentially people invoke proteins as the main drivers. 
It's, it's self-assembly or phase separation of the proteins um, that produces the structures. And DNA kind of comes along as, as a passenger, at least as I've understood the work. Um, there have also been a, a very large number of, of computational or theoretical and theoretical models that have been put forward over the years um, uh, to account for uh, compaction and organization of chromatin. Uh, a very nice, uh, really elegant model um, uh, was published last year by the, by the Mirny Lab, I think we're also going to be hearing about, um, where they uh, essentially uh, uh, marked the different regions of, of chromatin, euchromatin, heterochromatin, constitutive heterochromatin, um, uh, across the genome, and then uh, ascribed either self-self interactions or self-other interactions among these different kinds of chromatin. And what they showed is that if they, they set the parameters right, they could really very beautifully produce an organized structure of these three different classes of chromatin, sort of a bullseye pattern here, that, that looks really strikingly like um, the, the organization in these very interesting um, uh, rod cells of nocturnal animals where the, the organization of chromatin is inverted compared to most other cells. Um, and so again, they showed that it was sufficient to get, uh, to get this kind of phase separated structure through, through characterizing uh, the various attraction forces between different elements of chromatin. Um, but most of these models, um, th this one included, generally lack molecular mechanisms for, for driving this phase separation process. So we came into this problem through some of the ideas that, that I described to you uh, earlier. Um, and the notion is that we recognized uh, long ago that chromatin can really be viewed as a multivalent polymer. Um, the nucleosome, you can think of it as the basic functional unit, is the histone octamer wrapped around with these very acidic stretches of DNA. Um, and those come in these very large arrays that is chromatin. Um, extending from the, the face of the nucleosome are the histone tails. Those are very basic. And so one can imagine um, essentially multivalent adhesive, adhesion between acidic DNA and basic tails. Um, of course, there are also very many, a uh, large number of, of post-translational modifications, marks that go on the histone tails, and many of the mark readers um, are multivalent in nature. And so one can imagine a multivalency being manifest in a couple of different ways. And so even though the scale of this system is very different from modular domain proteins, the nucleosome is much, much larger than a protein domain. And even though the DNA linkers here are much stiffer than the polypeptide chain, this essential feature of multivalent interactions really is the same. And so we had thought for quite a while that maybe chromatin um, uh, uh, could, could behave in analogous ways. Um, and it was absolutely consistent with a lot of data in the literature. It's been known for decades that if chromatin um, is put into physiologic salt, it, it precipitates. Um, and uh, we've looked in the literature, there, there's at least this one paper that we could, could find from Meishima now that actually looked at the nature of those precipitates and found that they were kind of these sort of globular looking, looking structures. And so we thought, again, it would, uh, the idea of phase separation would at least be consistent with some of these data in the literature. So to get at this, um, a postdoc in my lab, Brian Gibson, uh, working with uh, our lab manager, Linda Doolittle, um, uh, began simply by reconstituting a dodecameric array of nucleosomes using the Widom 601 sequence separated by, by linkers. They were able to uh, put fluorophores on the, on the histones. Um, and sure enough, if they transform or transferred those into physiologic salt, either monovalent salts or, or low concentrations of divalent salts, they found that they formed these, these beautiful round structures. And those structures contain both histones as well as, as double-stranded uh, DNA through a, through a dye for double-stranded DNA. Um, and I should note that Gideon Narlikar at UCSF has made similar uh, observations here as well. Um, these, the uh, assembly and formation of these, of these uh, structures uh, follows the, the, uh, many of the features we would expect for multivalency-driven phase separation. We can see uh, sharp transitions from no droplets 
uh, or no assembly to, to assembly as a function of, of salt concentration as well as a function of, of nucleosome concentration. Moreover, the, the amount of salt necessary to drive this process um, uh, varies with the, with the length of the nucleosome arrays, with 12, 12 mer arrays uh, phase separating more readily than six mers and much more readily than four mers. Now, the chromatin in these, in these uh, structures that are formed, as I'll show you these, these liquid droplets that are formed, um, is hugely concentrated compared to the surroundings. This is much more than we've seen in any, any other protein system. It's about 10,000 fold from the surroundings into, into the droplets. And the concentration that we see in the droplets, uh, about 350 micromolar, is pretty much right in the middle of, of estimates that people are made of concentrations of nucleosomes in eukaryotic nuclei, um, uh, which at least says, you know, that this, this would be consistent with what we know goes on in, on in cells. Um, these droplets are uh, dynamic uh, liquids. Um, if we photobleach them, we can see recovery on timescales of, uh, you know, roughly, roughly 10 minutes. Most of the fluorescence recovers. Um, it's slow enough that, of course, we, we uh, feel that this is a highly viscous liquid, but nevertheless, the molecules are moving around quite a bit. Um, one important point to make here is that we found that the, this behavior is, is, in fact, quite sensitive on exactly how you do the experiment. And that is, um, like other phase-separated systems that we've seen, photo damage induced by just imaging these things can cause them to become static. And so we, we, to, to see this liquid behavior, you've got to make sure that you're using fluorophores that, that cross-link less than others or damage less than others. Um, we've got to keep the fluorophore density fairly low. Um, and we've got to be careful about, about how brightly we, we are imaging these things. And if we, we are, if we do take those cares, again, as we do with other systems, um, very clearly these are, these are dynamic liquid droplets. Um, <clears throat> Interesting experiment you can do, you can make green ones and red ones, and you can then mix them together. And you'll see this here. Oh, if my movie will run, maybe I need my cursor back. Yeah. So you can watch uh, what happens when these mix, and you can, if you focus on this uh, magenta guy here in the center, um, what you'll see is that the green one comes up and boom, they fuse. And they round up very rapidly. This is a 25 minute movie. They round up quite rapidly. What I hope you can see is that they still contain that polar cap of the other color for, for quite a while. Um, and uh, if you look at this over time in, in still images, what you can see is that the fusion from the encounter complex to basically the round structure occurs uh, you know, faster than 30 seconds, but that green cap is retained for out to sort of 15 to 25 minutes. So what this suggests to us is that there's very, very high surface tension here, but that that's countering a very high viscosity. So surface tension means they round fast, and the slow diffusion suggests that they behave as a viscous liquid. Um, in terms of, of molecular drivers, we're still uh, working on this, but one of the things that we know is the histone tails are very important for this process. Um, if we chop the tails off uh, using a protease, um, essentially we can no longer see phase separation. Um, if we mutate the histone, so we can mutate out the so-called basic patch on, on histone, the histone H4 tail, and, and we lose phase separation there, um, interestingly, if we mutate the acidic patch on the nucleosome face, which has been shown to be essential for, for precipitation of chromatin, um, uh, we see uh, that we can still make droplets. We haven't quantified the difference here. It may be that they don't form as readily, but the patch doesn't seem as essential as it does in reports about, about precipitation. So it's related to precipitation of chromatin by salt, but not exactly the same, we think. So just to quickly summarize what I've told you before, polynucleosome arrays will undergo liquid-liquid phase separation in physiologic salts. Phase separation depends on nucleosome array length, um, and it condenses the chromatin to uh, uh, concentrations comparable to what's seen in cells. The dynamics are dynamic, but they are but they're highly viscous. The histone tails are important for this phase separation process. We don't yet know what interactions they're making. We're working on that. And again, just to make this point that the dynamics are quite sensitive to photo-induced cross-linking, this artifact that can result um, uh, if you're not careful with your imaging.
So if this is to all make any physiologic sense, I think one, one needs to ask, uh, you know, how do known chromatin regulatory factors act on this process? And so there are three aspects of this that we've looked at. I'll run you uh, through those here. Um, we've looked at histone H1 binding. We've looked uh, at the spacing between nucleosomes in the arrays. And we've also looked at the effects of acetylation of histone tails and, and uh, acetyl tail reader proteins. I'll take you through each of these separately. So uh, histone H1 is a well-known uh, uh, chromatin compaction factor, um, which has been known for, for a very long time to mediate, uh, again, uh, compaction of, of chromatin and um, uh, mediates changes in uh, decrease in nucleosome dynamics. Um, uh, a, a really cool paper uh, that um, uh, my, my postdoc, Brian, put me onto when we started this work, uh, he came from a back background in, in uh, genome regulation, um, uh, is the studies of, of histone H1 and tetrahymena. So tetrahymena, of course, has two nuclei, the micronucleus and the macronucleus, and they have different histone H1s. And what you can see is if you, if you delete the macronucleus histone H1, the macronucleus gets bigger and the micronucleus remains the same. If you, were, if you delete the micronucleus histone H1, the micronucleus gets bigger and the macronucleus doesn't change. So there really is this, this really very beautiful correlation across the two different nuclei types of histone H1 and compaction of, of, um, of the nucleus and, and the, the DNA within it. Um, there, there's a structure of histone H1, of the globular domain of histone H1 bound to a nucleosome. Um, and it shows that it binds at the dyad axis. And the idea is that it looks like it rigidifies the nucleosome and also imparts asymmetry to the structure. So when we add histone H1 to uh, our phase-separated uh, chromatin droplets, we see behavior that very much mimics these observations in cells. And so first we can see that histone H1 favors phase separation. Um, the threshold salt concentration necessary for phase separation is appreciably lower with histone H1 than without it. Um, it also decreases uh, the dynamics, essentially solidifies the droplets. You can see with histone H1 here um, that there's kind of these uh, abortive uh, fusion events. Um, and that's also consistent with FRAP, where we essentially, over a time course of 20 minutes, don't see any recover of, uh, of uh, fluorescence after photobleaching. Um, so, so we see ch uh, changes in threshold concentration, changes in dynamics. Um, we also see compaction, at least as measured uh, imperfectly by fluorescence brightness, excuse me, the brightness of fluorescence intensity. With histone H1, we see brighter droplets than without. So again, all of these behaviors are consistent with what histone H1 has been shown to do in cells. What about nucleosome space? So um, it's been known literally since the, the late 1970s, so for many years, that there's this interesting pattern across the genome of, of spacing between individual nucleosomes. And the pattern is as follows. Um, spacings that are 10 N base pairs, so 10, 20, 30, 40 base pairs, um, are depleted. In across on a, on a genome wide basis, and everything from, from yeast, which is shown here in black, um, out to mouse into humans, uh, mouse is shown here in gray. In contrast, 10n plus 5 spacing, 15 base pairs, 25, 35, etc., um, is favored. And so there's kind of oscillatory pattern. Um, you can make it out very strongly if you send this through, through a high pass filter. Um, and the reasons for this have really not been, been understood uh, in the past. Uh, one of the things that, that has been shown is that 10N spacing, the one that is disfavored on a genome-wide basis, is a spacing that favors the 30 nanometer fiber. And so, um, in fact, there are, there are now uh, cryo-EM structures of that 30 nanometer fiber formed from uh, nucleosome arrays um, that, <coughs> excuse me, that, that have um, uh, that, that 10 N spacing. One of the things that, that uh, uh, one can understand is that because there are 10.4 base pairs per turn, the 10 N spacing, 20, 30, 40, um, essentially points sequen uh, sequential nucleosomes um, in the same direction. Whereas 10 N plus 5 spacing 
as sequential nucleosomes a turn and a half or two and a half or three and a half turns apart, they aim in opposite directions. And so when nucleosomes aim in the same direction that favors 30 nanometer fibers, but why is 10n plus 5 the spacing that's favored in cells? What does it favor? Well, as, as you might, might have guessed, the way I set this up, um, uh, we looked at a series of 10n plus 5 or 10n uh, nucleosomes, and sure enough, the 10n plus 5 spacing strongly favors phase separation, whereas the 10n spacing quite substantially disfavors um, phase separation. Um, within the 10n plus 5 uh, group, as um, length increases, the density of the droplets increases. Probably you just got more nucleosomes further away from each other. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but, but together, these results uh, suggest to us that, that perhaps phase separation really is used in vivo to organize chromatin. And perhaps that's why the 10n plus 5 spacing um, is favored on a genome-wide level. And of course, it also implies that chromatin remodelers, which, which can define nucleosome spacing in many cases and move nucleosomes around, may be things that could control this phase separation process in vivo. So the last thing I want to want to tell you about um, is uh, acetylation. Now, acetylation is well known to open chromatin, and at a functional level, that means it, it enables processes like like uh, transcription and DNA repair. And to understand what acetylation does um, to to our droplets, uh, Brian rigged up a, a very nice way of essentially targeting the uh, histone acetyl transferase domain of the P three hundred hat protein um, to DNA. And so he put um, uh, a DNA sequence, uh, TEDO, into one of our arrays. He fused the catalytic domain of P300 to the TETR um, uh, transcription factor, um, which binds specifically to that site with very high affinity. Um, that interaction can be dissociated by doxycycline. And of course, in order for the, the histone cell transferase to function, we need to add acetyl-CoA. And so he analyzed this system using a combination of fluorescence microscopy and also uh, Western blood. And so what he found is that in the absence of acetyl-CoA, in the absence of doxycycline, which is to say when our artificial histone acetyl transferase binds to DNA, um, we can see the DNA uh, forms uh, uh, droplets, and sure enough, if we GFP label our acetyl transferase, it goes into those droplets. And in this condition, of course, we don't see substantial, we don't see any histone um, uh, acetylation. Um, if we add doxycycline, the, we no longer see concentration um, of the acetyl transferase, uh, the engineered acetyl transferase into these droplets. We don't see, um, uh, again, uh, acetylation. There's no acetyl-CoA in. If we add acetyl-CoA now into this system, we see that the droplets go away, and of course there's, there's no concentration. So high-level acetylation, as you can see here in the Western, um, essentially destroys the phase-separated droplets. Um, and <coughs> excuse me, if we don't, all, if we don't concentrate um, the acetyl transferase into those droplets, uh, we, we substantially decrease I'm not quite to absolute zero, but we substantially decrease acetylation and we, we no longer see loss of the droplets. Um, it's interesting as you can watch this in real time. So again, you're watching the nucleosomes here on the right, nucleosome uh, droplets. Um, you're looking at our, our acetyl transferase system here on the left. Cursor back. And um, we add acetyl-CoA at the beginning. And what you'll see is the droplets get steadily dimmer, and then disappear. And so that suggests how phase-separated chromatin could be controlled by uh, histone acetylation. It suggests that perhaps that the, the process of opening chromatin really is the disruption of these interactions and the loss of phase separation. We can, uh, again, look at still frames here, and what you see is initially the, the droplets get a little bit bigger, and they also get dimmer. So they get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, and, and then eventually uh, disappear. And so it suggests one mechanism of giving different uh, uh, chromatin domains with different physical properties and, and different compositions um, could be to get partial acetylation, which gives you different density. 
Now, we've had a, a wonderful collaboration with uh, Daniel Gerlich's lab uh, at the IMP in Vienna, and particularly his student, Max Schneider, um, who've examined some of these issues uh, in cells. And so what, what they're pros at in the Gerlich lab, uh, among other things, at uh, doing is they can inject um, various uh, uh, molecules into, into the nucleus um, uh, of live cells. And so what they did here is they co-injected with different fluorescent labels either unmodified arrays, those are the arrays that should face separate, or highly acetylated arrays, arrays and those uh, uh, do not face separate. And what we can see is that, that in cells, if you look at the differential uh, staining, and um, you, can, you can see quantification of that here at the right, that the unmodified arrays co-localize quite strongly with, with DNA. You can compare the DNA stain here um, with the unmodified chromatin label here, um, whereas the acetylated arrays, which, which we believe do not have the same kind of self-association strength as the unmodified, um, uh, co-localize with DNA much more poorly. So these data are consistent with the idea that greater self-association of, of the non-acetylated arrays. Um, those who look at this might say, oh, the unmodified arrays are all going to heterochromatin. Um, we really are not sure w whether... whether um, the staining pattern reflects heterochromatin or not, we should be clear on that. Um, and we can see a different result if the chromatin architecture in those cells is previously disrupted um, uh, by trichostatin A, which essentially causes massive acetylation of, of the genome, uh, essentially passivization of the, the genome. If we inject our non-acetylated arrays into those nuclei, now we can see that in even the complex milieu of the nucleus, um, uh, if the DNA is passivated previously, we can see what look to be these phase-separated droplets. Um, if we inject acetylated chromatin in, we can still see some droplets forming, and I'll get to that in, in just a sec, but clearly there are, there are many fewer and they are, they are much smaller. And again, they were able to quantify through looking at covariance of fluorescence um, uh, differences in um, uh, the, those, those foci, even when we know that we've injected roughly the same amount of material. And so it's consistent, again, with the idea that non-acetylated arrays are able to phase separate, even in the very complex uh, uh, environment of the nucleus, if we don't have the, the DNA of the nucleus able to adhere to it quite strongly. Um, the last thing that I wanted to tell you about um, gets to this issue of uh, chromatin reader proteins. Um, because uh, we were very interested in all along, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, once the, the chromatin is heavily acetylated, there are proteins that will bind to acetylated chromatin that often come with multiple uh, arrays. And in particular, um, there's a, a domain called a bromo domain. It's a modular domain found in many uh, chromatin regulatory proteins, binds specifically to acetylated lysins, histone acetylated lysins. And so we were able to, to make uh, both an engineered polybromo protein as well as look at a, a known uh, chromatin regulator protein called BRD4 that has two bromo domains. Um, and <clears throat> what we find is, again, if we acetylate our chromatin, that chromatin uh, does not form uh, these phase-separated droplets. However, if we add back this pentabromo protein, this engineered pentabromo protein, or if we add back BRD4 itself, we can reconstitute a new phase-separated structure, um, uh, which is dependent on uh, acetylation and also on uh, the bromo proteins. Um, if we have a mutant in the, in the polybromo protein that doesn't bind um, acetylhistones, uh, we don't see uh, formation of this phase. Uh, we also need high valency, because if we go in, or high valence, if we, if we have only a single bromo domain, we also don't induce this. Um, in the BRD4 case, we can add JQ1, which inhibits the bromo uh, acetyl tail interaction. Again, we lose those droplets. <clears throat> now, interestingly, uh, we asked ourselves, well, you know, we can make a, a form of condensed chromatin that's not acetylated. We can make a different form of condensed chromatin that is acetylated and has a bromo protein. How do those relate to each other? So the last experiment that I'll show you here, um, uh, basically we have mixed uh, unacetylated chromatin, which is labeled in green, and unacetylated chromatin, which is labeled in magenta. 
And in the absence of the pentabromo protein, even though both of these chromatin um, arrays are in solution, only the unacetylated chromatin um, forms uh, these discrete droplets. If we add the pentabromo protein to it then, we get now also phase separation of the acetylated material. And what we thought was just really cool is that those are distinct phases. We see a distinct magenta phase of unacetylated material and a distinct green phase of acetylated chromatin with the bromo protein. They adhere to each other, um, but they do not uh, coalesce. And so what this shows us is that phase separation could be a mechanism that produces distinct chromatin domains with different physical properties and, and ultimately different functions. Of course, we, we don't know that this is the mechanism that does it, but it certainly, I think, shows sufficiency that phase separation, passive phase separation of these kinds of systems would be sufficient to produce discrete domains with different compositions and ultimately activities. So let me just wrap up um, in the last uh, couple of minutes here. Uh, so essentially what, what um, uh, I've shown you here is a, a model in which phase separation could play an important role in contributing to the organization of chromatin. Um, certainly what we've shown is that phase separation is an inherent property of the chromatin polymer. Um, simply putting chromatin um, arrays into physiologic salt is sufficient to cause them to, to, to undergo liquid-liquid phase separation to form these droplets. Um, and there are a number of different regulatory factors that I've described to you that, that can act on those droplets. I've talked to you about linker length, uh, length of the linker DNA, um, histone H1 and acetylation of bromoproteins, and shown you that these could, and, and, we, and our data there suggests that these could provide a mechanism for compaction and, uh, and dynamics, um, and that these could produce uh, distinct domains. And so kind of the idea is that you've got this inherent capacity of chromatin to phase separate, and then there are all different kinds of regulatory factors that can act on that. Linker DNA, histone H1, acetylation, acetylation of bromo domains, many other marks, many other mark readers, and that these can then tune the different properties. They can tune the, the capacity to form a condensed structure. They can tune the density of that structure. Probably they also can tune uh, the dynamics of that, of that structure, although honestly we haven't looked at that yet. Um, and we can also form different kinds of demixed phases um, <clears throat> that, that will uh, uh, abut each other but, but, not, but not mix. And so, um, you know, this uh, capacity of chromatin to undergo uh, phase separation be regulated this way, um, uh, it would be highly complementary to the models uh, that, I, that I talked about at the very beginning from other people um, where, where some of these factors themselves can phase separate. Um, and so the combination of phase separation of proteins, phase separation of chromatin, and the interaction between those um, could produce a, a very wide variety of, of uh, chromatin structures and chromatin physical properties and chromatin functions in the cell. Um, and so I think this is a, a, an interesting area that certainly we are going to be uh, pursuing um, uh, and hopefully will inspire um, uh, some out there also uh, to look at chromatin uh, through this lens. So I'll just finish up by, by thanking the people I've had the good fortune to work with in the lab over the years. Um, uh, all of our early work on phase separation, some of those basic principles was worked out uh, by three very important graduate students, Sadiq Banjade, Wei Chin Chang, and P. Long Li. Um, the work that I talked to you about um, uh, today on, on phase separation chromatin was all done by, by a really talented postdoc, Brian Gibson. Um, Brian's going on the job market this fall. Any institutions that have the money to hire in the face of the pandemic, uh, look at Brian. He's very, very good. And he's working with a, a terrific technician in the lab, Linda Doolittle. Um, uh, this has been a great collaboration, uh, actually a three-way collaboration. I mentioned Daniel Gerlich and his uh, student, Max Schneider, but also we've had a, a productive and really fun time also interacting with uh, Cy Redding uh, at UCSF. And so I thank all of these people uh, for their uh, uh, work uh, 
in the lab on phase separation, particularly on this project. And again, I want to thank um, all of the uh, organizers of this workshop for uh, allowing me to, to participate and kick us off at the beginning. And uh, hopefully uh, those out uh, uh, across the electronic uh, airwaves have been paying attention. So I will thank you for your attention. And um, I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Mike, so we have uh, the opportunity to ask uh, questions now, and uh, Mike will join us live for this. I hope he's here. I, I am here and live. Can people okay. hear me? Uh, yes, we can. So, uh, so uh, the way to do this is uh, the easiest way to do it is to just raise your hand, which is a facility available through the participants. If you go to participants, you'll be able to raise your hand. And I already see one hand, so I will ask Leonid Mirny to uh, pose a question. Hello, can you see me? Yes. Leonid, okay. hello. Uh, hi. Somebody uh, has excellent. to meeting, hello. Yes, nice. Uh, excellent story. Sort of, I have a couple of questions. The first group one is, what's the role of methylation in all of this? Because you spoke about acetylation and lengths. And, and the other question is, so you, you started showing by, by, by essentially indicating that there was a huge difference in the density of this condensates, uh, the droplets versus the solvent. But I wonder what's the difference in the density of like condensates versus no condensates? Like, uh, uh, so if you, can, if you can, for example, make some of, the, some of the material condensate and the rest float around. So would you, would, would, would you be able to maintain these droplets in the, with, with the, not 10,000 high density, but say a factor of 10 high density or a factor of two high density. Is it possible to modulate this in some uh, way? So, yeah, so, so, so good questions. Um, so <clears throat> let's see, um, in terms of methylation, uh, the short answer is we don't know. We, we haven't looked yet. My guess is that methylation, because it preserves the charge on, on the lysine tail, changes the nature of the charge, but, it, but it's still there, um, uh, will have a lesser effect on disrupting uh, the condensates. Um, but, but of course then, you know, do methyl tail readers, um, methylated tail readers also uh, play a role? Um, probably, probably they will. And so one could imagine that, that you will get um, differences in interactions that could change the inherent properties of the chromatin droplets, and then the tail readers could, could modulate those further. Um, you know, Gita Narlikar is, is speaking on the last day and has looked at, <clears throat> excuse me, at, at, at HP1 and shown that, that it can, A, phase separate on its own, and then B, bring in methylated chromatin. So I'll be interested to see what she has to say. In terms of modulating the density, um, the, <clears throat> so certainly acetylation, if you let it go only partially, um, we'll give you droplets that have different density. And we presume then, we haven't measured it, presume those will have different partition coefficients. Mm -hmm. which is the ratio of, the, of, of concentration in the droplet to concentration in the media. Mm -hmm. um, at some level of acetylation, you could reduce it down to, to the numbers that, that you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. What you asked about. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Okay, now we will have a series of questions from people at Rice University, starting with Peter. <laughs> it's, it's a very nice, uh, very, very nice talk. And uh, um, I, I wanted to, uh, and, and it works in a length scale that uh, uh, we, we haven't uh, explored very much uh, between the nucleosome and the, um, and, and, and the larger uh, systems of the chromosome. Uh, but I wanted to sort of bring up, uh, with all this discussion of condensates, um, uh, I would say uh, what I always hear about as the description is the density. The, the order parameter is a, is a scalar. Um, one of the things that Bin Zhang's uh, studies uh, showed when he was working with me, and I'm sure he's done more with this lately, is that there's at least a local tendency to forming an anisotropic system, a, a liquid uh, crystalline uh, system. Mm. That's actually well known in fact, in magnesium, DNA condensates from back in the, well, in my childhood, I believe. Uh, uh, so I wondered if, if uh, uh, everything looked kind of spherical, but my first question was, do you sometimes see the condensates being 
ellipsoidal, number one. Number two, have you ever looked with a cross-polarizer to see if there is a, a order of the DNA uh, yeah. in these droplets? So, so the images that I've seen and that Brian has showed me, Brian has, has seen many more of these than I have, obviously he's in the trenches, um, have basically all been round. Mm. And so we haven't seen anisotropy in them. Like, like, for example, Margaret Gardell has seen when she's created um, uh, liquid droplets composed of actin filaments and, cr mm. and actin crosslinkers, and then she very clearly sees football-shaped things. We haven't put them under polarizers yet. We have put them into um, a cryo-electron microscope or electron microscope. Um, and we don't see, you know, we can make out individual nucleosomes and we're trying to figure out how to do that uh, in a more effective automated way. Um, but, we, but we don't see um, uh, <clears throat> evidence of any kind of significant elongated uh, anisotropic structures. Mm, okay. that, that, that's at very, very, very early stages. Thank you. Thank you. So next question will actually be from someone from Northeastern who used to be at Rice. So Herbie <laughs> Levine. Uh, hi. Uh, I guess hi. I should, un should video myself. I just had a simple question about the size distribution of the droplets in your in vitro experiments, in particular, whether you observe coarsening dynamics as you might expect for an equilibrium phase transition. Uh, whether that's actually seen or whether you think that is not true in your system or uh, uh, how, does, how does your system relate to sort of what, what a standard liquid liquid yeah. equilibrium so, dynamics would be. So, so we haven't quantified that here, but in other systems, absolutely, we see, you know, we can, we can quantify the coarsening dynamics. Certainly, we see um, lots of uh, evidence of, of fusion. So, so the droplets are getting bigger and bigger as they, as they collide with each other. Um, we, we haven't looked for, for things like Oswald ripening. Um, I would imagine that that's occurring uh, here as well. Um, but uh, like the, the, by, by, those, by those simple criteria, do we see fusion? Do they, does the distribution get larger over time? Absolutely, we do see that. I might just comment here that, uh, you know, in other situations where you are coupled to non-equilibrium processes, studies that Rick Young's lab and mine have done, you actually do not see this sort of process because right, but but in particular, the, the, you know, this in vi this in vitro experiment didn't seem to have that coupling. The in vitro experiment, it, uh, everything Mike says, I think right. is absolutely correct. correct. Anyway, so another the next question uh, will be from Jose Onuchik. Hello, uh, Jose. <clears throat> I'm gonna see. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have a question about uh, the about the acetylation experiment. I think they were great experiments because you have this sort of uh, phase transition accompanied by opening the DNA with acetylation. My question is on time scales. Is that something that will affect just different cell types, or could you measure you could have acetylation at the time? Uh, in a process in a, in a single cell. So based what are the time scales associated with this process of uh, phase separation plus opening? Do you want to comment on that when you go to the real nucleus? Yeah, um, I, I honestly don't, don't know. You know, in, in a biochemical experiment, you can make it occur on kind of any time scale you want, depending on how much of the enzyme that you add, right? Um, and so, you know, we saw it in the experiment that I show on time scales in, you know, ten, tens of minutes. Um, uh, I'm, I'm uh, reasonably certain, although we haven't done it, that if we added more enzyme, we could, we could accelerate the process. I think a really, really interesting question that I've kicked around a bit with, with people like Rick Young and, and Ibrahim Sisse is when, when one sees acetylation um, occurring at you know, some, some site of active remodeling of the genome, should we envision, and especially when, when one sees, for example, successive recruitment of various factors to a transcription site. They come and they go and they come and they go. Should we envision that that site is undergoing cycles of acetylation to open and then de deacetylation to close, boom, 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 boom? Or should we envision that the acetylation process is on a much slower time scale so that chromatin opens and then factors come in, come in and out as, as they see fit? 
to do that, one, one needs some kind of uh, uh, rapidly uh, or high dynamic probe that will report on that. And I'd love to do that experiment. If people are interested, um, please come talk to me. Now, this is an interesting thing. Well, think about maybe a scintillation is responsible for some slow time scale that may be associated to different cell types. Basically, you have then and one cell type, and then you have some other process that are responsible for the opening and closing on short time scales. But it's a very interesting, but well, it's beautiful experiments anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? What was that? Uh, so I don't see, uh, yes, no, I don't see any more hands. So we are right on time, uh, a minute early actually. So it's 11.04, I believe. So Mike, thank you very much for the wonderful talk and uh, also for taking the time to answer the questions. Well, thank you very much. I, I'll be around much of the, the workshop. Um, if people have other questions, uh, send me an email. We have to, to answer more. Thanks very much. Thank you. So um, we have 151 participants that have been on more or less since the beginning. So that's good for a video meeting like this. So we'll move forward and uh, get on with the next talk, which will be the first talk of the first session, really, because the first uh, Mike's talk was the keynote address. Uh, the first talk will be given by Patrick Kramer from uh, the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. And the title of his talk is Recent Advances in Understanding Chromatin Transcription. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm uh, Patrick Kramer. I'm very happy to tell you about our most uh, recent data. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present here at this workshop. So, in this review by John List that came out about 10 years ago, the critical steps in RNA polymerase II transcription at the beginning of a gene are depicted. And these are all steps that can be regulated in eukaryotic cells. Um, first, the chromatin needs to open so that you generate a nucleosome depleted region. Then the pre-initiation complex containing RNA polymerase too, but also general factors can assemble at the promoter. Now the DNA will open. So you have a single template strand from which RNA synthesis can start. And the polymerase will escape from the promoter, but often it will pause in the promoter proximal region. And then it needs to exchange factors to generate a activated and released elongation complex, which is then able to very rapidly move through nucleosomes. Today, um, I want to concentrate on mainly two aspects on this scheme. But just to tell you that our laboratory over the last two decades or so has tried to serve the community by providing structural details of many of the aspects um, of these different regulatory steps. We are not done yet, but we have learned quite a lot about the various events in the beginning of transcription. But today I really focus on the most recent work and also quite a bit of unpublished work. Uh, in the first half of the talk, I will concentrate on the chromatin opening issue right at the beginning, how you form a nucleosome depleted region. And then in the second half of the talk, I will concentrate on the step of pausing and report some interesting new insights with respect to nuclear condensation and phase separation, as I know that many of you are interested in these phenomena. So concerning the beginning um, of the whole process, when you generate a nucleosome depleted region, you could um, simplify by saying that there's three classes of factors required. First, so-called pioneer factors, which are able to recognize and to bind to nucleosomes. Uh, this can be considered as the first step in opening these nucleosome depleted regions. And then chromatin remodelers, so mainly of the switch Smith family, which use the energy of ATP hydrolysis to either evict nucleosomes or to slide the nucleosomes that are flanking this region to be depleted to the side. 
And then finally, co-activators such as the Saga complex, which can recruit factors like the Tata box binding protein, but also these co-activators will modify histone tails so that chromatin is more uh, permissible to transcription. So why did it take so long to investigate the mechanisms of pioneer factor action? I think one reason is that you need to have a sequence that allows for both nucleosome uh, formation, histone octamer binding, and pioneer factor binding. And we were able to achieve this in a collaboration with UC Palace lab. And this actually led to the first structure of a pioneer transcription factor called SOX2, one of the famous Yamanaka factors bound to the nucleosome at superhelical location 2, as you can see here. So this animation summarizes some of the key findings of this recent structure, which is actually now just published um, uh, in Nature. You can read about it. So here SOX is binding, and when it does so, there's a clash with the neighboring DNA gyre, and it will actually facilitate uh, the detachment of terminal DNA ends in the nucleosome. This can happen from both sides. So the, uh, about two to three turns of DNA are becoming accessible on both sides of the nucleosome. And you can imagine that other factors can now bind to these ends and uh, stabilize this partially unraveled state. So the, the key issue here is that we think that binding energy uh, can already begin or help in the beginning of the opening process. Another interesting aspect of the structure is that when the SOX factor binds, it will be incompatible with the uh, classical stacking of nucleosomes that you see here on the left because this involves the histone H4 tail, but we see that the SOX factor is actually repositioning that tail, so the classical stacking interaction is not possible. Now, what about these switch sniff remodelers that come in and uh, open or extend the nucleosome depleted region? We know from a work from others, uh, in particular also the lab of Philip Korber in Munich, that switch sniff remodelers, especially in the yeast system, the risk complex, uh, it's important to uh, generate a nucleosome depleted region that is seen here in blue uh, that is comparable to the native region that you find in cells, which you see here on the very left. So risk is clearly important in generating this nucleosome depleted region. And again, we use structural biology to get one of the first structures of, of one of these large switch sniff chromatin remodelers, which um, in this case, uh, the risk complex also has over DOS and subunits. And um, this allowed us to get to a model for how uh, these uh, remodelers can extend the nucleosome depleted region because uh, they can actually bind in opposite directionality to the plus one and the minus one nucleosomes that you see here on the right and on the left, respectively. Uh, and then the directionality of the process is such that the nucleosomes will actually be uh, shifted outwards so that the nucleosome completed region is extended. And just one word about co-activators, in this case, the Saga complex. Again, we're talking about very large complexes, uh, multi-subunit complexes. And in the case of Saga, you have four functional modules, a histone acetyltransferase um, module, which will uh, acetylate histone tails, making chromatin or rendering it uh, into an active state, a deubiquitination module that takes off ubiquitin, and then the core module, which we newly built here, uh, which is similar to the co-activator TF2D, it also contains such a form um, module, and this can bind the Tata box binding protein. And finally, the TRA1 module was previously already solved and shown to bind to activators, transcriptional activators for targeting this co-activator. Now, with this, I want to get to the stage of initiation, and you may wonder why and how polymerases are recruited to promoters, provided that most likely there's a massive competition between promoters that are active for 
uh, polymerases, and you do need to deliver a lot of polymerases for time in order to get high initiation frequencies. So we have evidence um, that's published maybe one and a half, two years ago, that the C-terminal repeat domain, which is this tail-like extension of the polymerase that is drawn here approximately to scale, that this CTD is important for the delivery and the recruitment of polymerases to genes uh, through um, a phenomenon of uh, phase separation or nuclear condensation in cells. So why do we think so? It's actually that when you make recombinant CTD, uh, you can get uh, droplets in solution, they phase separate, and then in a collaboration with Markus Zweckstetter and Xavier Dajak, um, who has a, a great lab at Berkeley, we could actually provide evidence that these forces that are needed for clustering and self association of the CTD will be important to cluster polymerases in cells. So on the left, you see here a high resolution image of a human cell nucleus uh, for a wild type cell, and you see a few hundred of these polymerase clusters. But then when we use a cell line that has a CTD that is truncated to about half of its length, you can see far less clusters, and you can see that these clusters also on average have lower intensity. So we think the CTD um, is phase separating in vitro and in vivo. It can contribute to the condensation, the clustering of polymerases. So now you may wonder how can you then, if polymerases stick together, make sure that polymerases are released into actively transcribed regions of the gene. And actually it was known for decades that there's a kinase called CDK7. It's part of the pre-initiation complex that you see here structurally. And this kinase was long known and shown by others to phosphorylate the CTD. And this phosphorylation event is important for the escape of polymerases into actively transcribed regions. So when we added the CDK7 in its active form uh, as a complex with the cyclin and another subunit, and we added ATP, um, the CTD in our in vitro studies was phosphorylated and these droplets rapidly were dissolved. So phosphorylation is incompatible with the phase separation phenomenon. And this was one of the observations together with many other observations from different laboratories around the world, including also the Boston labs, um, uh, Rick Young, Phil Sharp, uh, that led us to propose this model that you see here in a review that I wrote last year um, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the eukaryotic polymerases. And according to that model, the um, polymerases would be part of this condensate that forms around transcriptional activators uh, and around promoters. And of course, there's many other factors in there like the mediator and so forth. Uh, but um, the idea is then when you phosphorylate the polymerase, it will not be retained in this condensate, but it will be released into the gene body and then maybe at genes that are highly transcribed and where there's a lot of RNA processing going on, you form a second condensate, which we call gene body condensate. You could also call it processing condensate. And actually the, the lab of Rick Young has very interesting data where they see that splicing factors can form these phase separated droplets and they can also accommodate phosphorylated CTD. So, uh, I think this is a model that provides a good basis for further testing. Now, what is uh, also interesting is when you ask the question, how does the polymerase shuttle now from the uh, promoter condensate to the gene body condensate, how exactly is that process regulated? Um, what is quite clear is that at this interface, the promoter proximal pausing is occurring. And as I said, in metasome cells, this uh, is a general phenomenon that occurs at a large uh, number of genes. So there's a step in between initiation that you see here on the left and the uh, formation of the processive and fully active elongation complex that we have called EC star. In between, you have a pause complex or PEC, pause elongation complex, 
And uh, this includes the factors DSIF and the negative elongation factor male. It has long been known that the kinase CDK9, which is a subunit of PTFB, is responsible for the conversion of uh, this pause complex into a released and activated complex. And we recently used biochemistry to show that in vitro, this actually requires these factors SPT6 and the path complex. Um, but it was not known what the mechanism for the conversion of these complexes uh, from the pause to the activated state would be. So we used again integrated structural biology and biochemistry to investigate this. And that is published so very briefly, um, just to mention that we have the structures of both intermediates, the pause complex here on the left and the activated elongation complex on the right. And we found possible mechanisms for the exchange of the factors and how that depends on phosphorylation events. Uh, just briefly, these phosphorylation events will destabilize the post elongation complex and they will stabilize the um, EC star. And this is how the switch uh, takes place. And essentially, because the NELF complex and the PATH complex bind to overlapping sites, uh, they cannot coexist. So you either bind the negative elongation factor to polymerase or the path complex. And this is a, a very nice molecular switch that exists in cells. Now I want to share these unpublished data, and they are related to uh, the more cellular function of the male complex and how this is related to the phase separation and condensation phenomena. Um, and this is a very nice collaboration with the lab of Ritwik. Savarka, um, and what they actually found is that when they have a GFP labeled subunit of NELF, NELF A, and they use human cells and they uh, induce heat shock, so they just elevate the temperature, they see this massive condensation of NELF in the nuclear of these human cells, and this is actually a reversible phenomenon. So when cells recover from heat shock, this condensation goes away. So we were therefore using our recombinant material to look at phase separation. And quite strikingly, we found massive phase separation when we just used the four subunit full length NELF complex. Uh, it phase separates very nicely. And of course, the question was then, uh, what is driving this phase separation? Because according to the structure, we have quite a compact fold of these NELF proteins on the surface of the polymerase. But we know from the structure that there's two very extended, intrinsically disordered regions in NELF. One is this one here in the NELF A subunit, and the other one here in the NELF E subunit. And because of their you know, extended and mobile nature, we call them the tentacles at the time. And we didn't really know what they would be doing, but now we found through that collaboration that uh, these tentacles are very important for the phase separation of NELF because if you make recombinant NELF complex that lacks either the NELF A or the NELF E tentacle, then um, the uh, phase separation is very strongly impaired. You hardly get any droplets anymore at this concentration. Now, the last question is, is, are these tentacles also important in vivo? And are they related at all to this function in the stress response? And very strikingly, that is indeed the case. So in this experiment that now Ritwick and his um, co-workers conducted, uh, you see on top the normal phenomenon that they observe. So you go from a standard cell under normal growth conditions to heat shock, and you see this massive condensation of NELF in the nucleus. And then when you use a variant, so this is now cell line expressing a NELF variant that lacks one of the two uh, tentacles, the one from the NELF A subunit, this condensation phenomenon is not observed anymore. You see some weird thing going on, but it's, it's not the natural condensation phenomenon. So clearly this NELF A tentacle is also important for condensation and the stress conditions in vivo. And you can now ask, um, is actually the stress response itself functionally perturbed? And that is also the case. 
So normally what happens in a stress is that uh, transcription is globally down-regulated, except of course for the stress response genes, a few Boston genes, um, but most of the transcription is down-regulated. And this you see here on the left uh, in the wire type, you see the down-regulation using actually RNA labeling techniques. So this is newly synthesized RNA. But now when the nlf A tentacle is missing, um, you see that there's a defect in down-regulation. You don't see this global down-regulation anymore. And uh, even more striking, when you look at cell viability, wild-type cells are perfectly fine under stress conditions because they have a normal natural stress response and they remain viable. But then the uh, cells that lack the mouth a tentacle region, they are clearly um, <coughs> impaired in their stress response and this can lead to uh, uh, impaired viability. So some of the cells begin to die in this experiment. So to summarize, maybe, and that is speculative, and maybe we can discuss it, um, there seems to be this very interesting interface between the promoter condensate the situation at the beginning of the gene, and then the situation at the gene body where RNA processing occurs, where transcription is processed, where all the positive elongation factors are present. But at this interface, there seems to be this checkpoint uh, that is not only important under normal growth conditions where the cell makes sure that the factors get loaded that are important for RNA processing and for making a mature messenger RNA, but also when there's a stress, uh, this checkpoint is probably used to uh, attenuate transcription here, and the male factor seems to be extremely important in that, and it's obviously also related to this very exciting new type of uh, condensation phenomenon. So maybe there's a condensate forming only uh, during stress conditions, which stores complexes, early elongation complexes or so, and then when the stress is relieved, you can very quickly resume transcription. We don't know that yet, but it's a model that is very interesting to follow up and to investigate further. So finally, maybe in the last uh, minute or two, uh, is how is all of this related to chromatin? So what's the role of the nucleosomes at the beginning of the gene um, for elongation control? Uh, this has been a long debate and uh, it's very difficult to find out about cause and consequence and not just to see correlations between activity and uh, nucleosome positions and occupancy. Um, but one interesting observation is that when you align uh, MNAs data at the pause site, at the promoter proximal pause site, and this S is done here, you see this peak of the plus one nucleosome just in front of the pause polymerase. And you also see that this peak is higher uh, for genes that have more pause polymerase and that are more dependent uh, on CDK9. Uh, and the question is, of course, what is this situation look, what does it look like in, in three dimensions? So what is the spacing of the nucleosome with respect to the pause polymerase. And Lucas, um, who is um, in our lab and will soon actually move to Boston, could solve um, two years back uh, one of the first structures of polymerase in complex with the nucleosome. And it happens to be at this spacing uh, um, that we observe in vivo. So the polymerase is just at the edge of the nucleosome. It has not yet unraveled the nucleosome and it's paused there. So um, through that structure and combining it with other structures, we can actually get to a model at this very complex situation at the beginning of the genes. And this is um, what I use now to summarize some of, what I, some of the things that I've told you today. Um, because we use now the spacings between the pre initiation complex, the pause complex, and the plus one nucleosomes, the spacings that we observe in cells from functional genomics, we use those distances in order to make a model using our detailed atomic structures for the situation at the promoter. And this is the model that you get. What is quite striking is that everything fits together. There's no major clashes, so this could actually exist in cells. But please um, 
remember that uh, it's known from studies of others, mainly using live cell imaging, that the lifetime of a pre-initiation complex is short, so in the range of seconds, whereas the pause complex, and that also agrees with our data, lives for minutes, and it can be uh, even, you know, more long-lived. So this is, you know, the situation, and I think it's very important to grasp this for understanding gene regulation, um, because the pausing is somehow related to the nucleosome in a way that's not fully understood yet, we're investigating it, but the pausing clearly will inhibit or disimpair new initiation and thereby can also regulate the frequency of initiation and the output in terms of RNA molecules per time. So in other words, it can regulate um, gene expression. I want to come to an end by thanking the people who have been involved. So my time is over. So very briefly, uh, Svetlana, Felix, and Haibo, they each solved one of these very interesting structures that I presented in the beginning, the um, pioneer factor structure, the uh, risk complex, the switch sniff remodeler, and then the Saga complex. Sandra and Christian were instrumental in getting the final pre-initiation complex and investigating its uh, DNA opening properties. And then Mark is the one in the lab who has looked at all the phase separation phenomena, uh, and especially, I mentioned this new collaboration with uh, Ritwik Sawaka and his uh, postdoc, uh, Prashant Ravat. Uh, we are very happy that we could engage in this collaboration. Then uh, Kerry was the one who did the first mammalian polymerase structure with DICIF, and Seychelle was building on this and doing all the biochemistry and the structural biology to get paused and activated elongation complexes. She collaborated with Lucas, and Lucas is also the one who did the beautiful work with the nucleosome. He will talk later about uh, chromatin remodeling in much more detail. And then uh, finally, Dimitri uh, is very important because he developed software to be used to uh, do all our cryo-electron microscopy. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Um, so for a unforeseen reasons this morning, uh, Patrick has not been able to join us, but on the other hand, we will have questions because two of his um, lab members, Lucas Farnan and Mark Burning, will be here to answer questions. So, so hopefully uh, uh, Mr. Farnan and uh, Mr. Burning, you're on. Yes, we're present. And I just also uh, want to extend Patrick's greetings to everybody here at the meeting. Um, there were just unforeseen, uh, f there was an unforeseen family emergency, so he couldn't make it today. No, we, we fully understand. So it's time for questions, but uh, so please uh, raise your hand as we had discussed. And uh, I, will, I, will, I will call on you to ask questions. So uh, Mike Rosen will be first. Well, thank you. Um, you know, beautiful work. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, for somebody outside the transcription field, um, you know, I'm curious how you see the, the relationship between the, the phase separated PAL2 condensates that one can make in vitro and, and the structures that the of PAL2 condensates that, that exist in cells. Um, are, are, the, are the cellular structures simply smaller versions of, of the larger things one can make in vitro? Or, or, is, there, or is there additional factors that, that make them somehow um, uh, different beyond simply that issue of scaling? So um, in principle, I think um, what emerges is a view that um, not just intrinsically disordered domains, but also other interactions of multivalent protein complexes can contribute to the process of phase separation, as basically um, you, your work also showed beautifully. And um, so what we think is actually that um, 
these structures or um, yeah, lock and key inter not lock and key interactions, but uh, dimeric interactions or multimeric interactions can be brought about through multiple um, yeah sort of um, ways, um, and that they all basically contribute to the condensates that we see. So we think um, both both matter the 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 structures the the yeah the the rather um solid interaction interfaces in the structures and um intrinsically disordered domains that can all contribute then to phase separation through the principle of multivalency i i might say that in some circumstances also that there are feedback mechanisms that will regulate the size of these things in a non-equilibrium way so these are not to be thought about i think in vivo in my view as simply equilibrium bodies so uh, we have a question next from uh, Shalampos Lazarus. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting talk. So I would like to ask the following. Uh, is there any difference in the behavior of genes, like, for example, the heat shock response genes that are actually upregulated in these conditions, like, uh, you know, during heat shock, uh, versus the others that are downregulated, uh, and like the NELF IDRs? Is there any connections with, uh, connection between the condensates and this uh, different behavior of genes? And if yes, how, how it's explained? So what we think at the moment is that um, these NALF bodies or NALF condensates under heat shock form specifically on genes that are down-regulated. Um, it has been reported that also, um, especially by John List, that also um, similar bodies form on um, upregulated genes, but these are not, as we think, these are not mediated through NALF in principle. Oh, great. Uh, can I have a quick follow-up question then? Uh, uh, what do you think makes the difference? Why the ones you, know, uh, the ones you described uh, are on the downregulated genes and different ones on the upregulated ones? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and that's something uh, I guess to be understood what on a molecular level makes the difference. But um, yeah, there are different bodies within the cell that all have a different composition. Um, so we think that, like certain scaffolding proteins, like in one case perhaps NALF, in the other case maybe HSF1, which has also been shown to face separate and mediates the heat shock induced upregulation um, could be another protein that serves as a sort of scaffold to um, yeah, determine the identity of these bodies. But this is uh, all speculation. We are not at that point to make claims on that. Thank you. We have another question from uh, Shubham Tripathi. Hi. Uh so, uh, uh, what happens to the? Is there any post translational modification of the NELF tails uh, in response to the uh, to the heat shock, which is responsible for the nuclear condensation? Yes, that is um, uh, two things that were left apart in the talk. Um, what we see is that um, if NELF is dephosphorylated which is the state where it basically binds to Pol2 and stabilizes the pores, it has a higher um, propensity to uh, self-interact. So phase separation is promoted. And um, what we also see is that um, zoomulation of NELF is required under the heat shock response to form these um, foci that then lead to stable Pol2 pausing. So we think there are two different mechanisms, which basically both need to, need to be present um, to then um, lead to condensation. Oh, okay. Now. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I think that, uh, are there any further questions? Okay, it's time to, Get going for the uh, first talk after the break. It'll be given by Dr. William Earnshaw from the University of Edinburgh. 
will speak on evolving DNA protein transactions during uh, mitotic chromosome formation. Hi, everybody. Well, I'd like to uh, thank Kristan and Arup for inviting me to this uh, virtual conference. Uh, it was quite fun when we had the meeting in Bulgaria last time, but it's, it's okay. Uh, we get used to the new world. So I'm going to talk to you about chromosome formation during mitotic entry uh, during my presentation today. And uh, it's coming to you from the Scottish borders. And actually, uh, this all depends on my neighbors. So. I live off the grid, basically, and if this guy who's my neighbor knocks into the, uh, the repeater, you're going to lose me, but I think we'll be okay. So uh, this is high-tech stuff. Right, so the structure of today's talk, I'm going to first start with just a really brief introduction to mitotic chromosome structure because that's what we work on. Um, then I'm going to talk about developing a system for near-perfect entry into mitosis. I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens during prophase, where some of the rules are changing. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've learned with this system. So let's start by talking about mitotic chromosome structure. Now, mitosis was named by Walter Fleming in 1878. And he said, I think I'll call it mitosis because mitosis, mitosis is the Greek word for thread. So watch this cell nucleus. As you see here, something is changing and threads are forming inside, and those threads are the mitotic chromosomes. The, the, then the nuclear envelope breaks down and the chromosomes line up on the mitotic spindle. So that's the process that we're interested in today. Now, uh, he didn't name chromosomes, but someone else named chromosomes, but you, know, you can imagine he was thinking, I wonder how these threads are put together. Maybe the DNA is helically coiled. That's what Baranetsky proposed in 1880. And so here you see some beautiful pictures. And you can see these chromosomes definitely look like they're coiled up. That's absolutely for sure. But on the other hand, maybe they are, maybe they're not organized. Maybe they're just a mass of spaghetti. And so here you see a micrograph by E.J. Dupra in the 1960s, but more, my, more modern cryo-electron microscopy has suggested that maybe the chromatin is just a bunch of spaghetti. It's not organized at all. But Uli Limley said uh, back in the in 1970s, no, no, the chromosome is organized into loops. And here you see a picture I took when I was a postdoc in Uli Limley's lab of a chromosome on an electron microscope grid. And you can definitely see this structure is surrounded by loops. So, hmm, it turns out that all the previous stories were correct. But that's a, that's a different talk. There's a, helix of a, uh, there's a helix of proteins on the inside that organizes chromatin into loops. And if you look at it overall, it looks random. So everybody was right. That's a different talk. We're going to go in a slightly different direction here. And that is, if there were loops in the chromosome, so here's a loop, what would be at the base of the loops? So Uli Lemley suggested that there was a protein scaffold along the axis of the chromosome. Then there was a huge fight. People said, oh, no, he was wrong. It was an artifact. And for a while, this was the world. So every time you mentioned the word scaffold, your paper got rejected. But it turns out that the scaffold is back now. So people now do believe that. Uh, and uh, some of the evidence for this came uh, from experiments where we, for example, uh, using methods I learned in Uli's lab, we isolated mitotic chromosomes and gradients. And here you can see the isolated chromosomes. We could run them on gels, but the other thing that we could do with them is we could put them in a mass spectrometer. So when we put them in the mass spectrometer, we could identify back in 2010. So using slightly old technology, somewhat over 4,000 proteins, there would probably be more now. But if you looked on a weight basis, you can see that the most of the chromosome, mass of the chromosomes are the most abundant proteins are the histones. That's these bears that you see here in this gel and they're present in nucleosomes. Now, the proteins that we thought that Uli Lemley suggested might be organized in the chromosomes were in a fraction of the chromosomes he called the chromosome scaffold. And one of the uh, abundant components of that scaffold is this complex here, which is called condensin. In fact, there's two types of condensin, but we won't need to know that for our talk today. And condensins uh, have this, this they're, they're composed of five different proteins here, SMC2, SMC4, and three auxiliary subunits. So these are proteins that were supposed to, that were thought to possibly organize the chromosome. And uh, here you can see if we stain for one of the two, uh, the two condensin components, that's this SMC2 protein, you see here a spread of chromosomes and you can see the blue haze is the DNA and the red running along the axis of the arms. 
is the, is the condensin, is the SMC2. So it looks just exactly like what Uli Lemley predicted. So in fact, what we then did is we uh, have used a variety of technologies over the years as technologies have advanced in time to knock out SMC2. And when you knock out SMC2, there's no condensin of any type left in the cell. So what happens? Well, I'm going to use, uh, introduce a technology that may not be familiar to all of you. This is serial block face scanning electron microscopy. And this is going to enable us to build three-dimensional images of a cell at high resolution. So we're going to take the cell and we're going to process it as though we did pro as, a, as though we were processing it for regular electron microscopy, and we're going to mount it in a special microscope. So this is the cell is in a little plastic. Uh, it's it's a, it's embedded in plastic here, and it's mounted on a pin, and it's inside a microscope. And you can see there's a blade in the microscope. So what we're going to do is we're going to lift the specimen up. We're going to use that knife, and we're going to shave 60 nanometers off of the top of the plastic specimen. Then we're going to lower the specimen, pull back the knife, and what we're going to do is we're not going to try to image the section, we're going to image the block that was left behind. And so that way we don't, we don't care what happens to the section, we're going to image the block. And so we'll never lose any piece of the image. People used to do this by trying to shave off the sections and then look at the sections, but you always lose one or two. This way we don't lose anything. And so here's a whole cell from top to bottom, 300 sections. Now the chromosomes are the darkest objects that you see here. There are also vesicles stained, but you can see the chromosomes here. You can see them in the right. All right, so we can see every section through this cell. So now let's look at a cell where we've depleted condensin. And uh, we're going to do the same analysis. So we're cutting the cell, and we're going to do a, a number of steps. So first we're just sectioning. Then by modeling, we're going to identify all the de density that corresponds to the chromosomes. So that's all the density corresponding to the chromosomes is now labeled in red. Then the next step of our analysis is called segmentation, and we, div we, uh, we, uh, we, we divide the, that, uh, the red material up into all the individual units that we can separate from, that we can resolve from one another. Okay, so when we do that, if we look at a wild-type cell, there are the mitotic chromosomes, and we can see them in three dimension, and this is a resolution of a few nanometers in X and Y and 60 nanometers in, in Z. So this is better than what we can get in a light microscope. And then here you see when we've depleted condensed and the chromosomes just look like a mess. So this, is a, this really showed that Uli Lemley was right, that these non-histone proteins, which were in what he called the chromosome scaffold, are absolutely required to assemble mitotic chromosomes. So here's where we've gotten so far in our, in our, in our quick little talk today. Chromosomes are organized by a non-histone scaffold as suggested by Uli Lemley. A key constituent of that scaffold is the constensin complex, which was identified by a guy named Tatsuya Hirano. In cells where you rapidly deplete the condensin complex, mitotic chromatin is compacted, but the chromosomes are just not shaped correctly. They don't look like chromosomes. But Chromosomes have thousands of proteins in addition to condensin. What about the other proteins? What are they doing and how, how, how do they change their relationships with DNA as the mitotic chromosomes form? That's what we're going to talk about in the rest of our, uh, in the rest of our uh, presentation today. So microscopy is great, but as Gary Larson pointed out, you can't answer every question with microscopy. So now let's talk about how we set up a system to study what's going in, uh, in very high resolution as cells enter mitosis. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a, a method called chemical genetics, and we're going to target an essential protein kinase, CDK1, cyclin-dependent kinase 1. The cell cycle here, mitosis G1, SG2, is driven by a series of cell cyclin-dependent kinases with different cyclins. But it turns out that CDK1 is absolutely required to enter mitosis. So if we engineer CDK1 so that its um, ATP binding pocket is a little bit bigger, we can then add an inhibitor called 1NMPP1, which will not bind to any other kinase in the cell, but will bind to this special CDK1 analog sensitive kinase. This is a methodology developed by Kevin Shokat. And uh, we can block the cell from entering into mitosis. And... Uh, you can buy one in MPP1, but if my Jim, a friend Jim Paulson from Minnesota, uh, from Wisconsin makes it for you, it, it works much better for whatever reason. We don't know why, but we get our one in MPP1 from Jim. 
Now, the really nice thing about this 1 and MPP1 is it completely inactivates the kinase. It stops the cell from entering mitosis, but you can wash it out really easily. And so here is a, I'm going to show you a movie made by Jan Rupert, who is a PhD student in my lab. So this is a colony of HeLa cells, which have been engineered so that their only CDK1 is that analog sensitive protein. And these cells are all sitting in G2 phase, waiting to go into mitosis. And now what we're going to do is we're going to wash out the 1 in MPP1 and watch what happens. If you study mitosis, this is magic. Because usually when you try to study mitosis, there are only 5 or 6% of the cells that are in mitosis at any one time. But these cells all enter mitosis at roughly the same time, if they're human cells. Uh, and, uh, but it turns out that there, we can do this even better. And we is Kamiko Samajima. She's a senior postdoctoral fellow in my group, and she's the person that set up the system that I'm telling you about today for synchronizing the cells. A, tr a chicken cell line called DT40, it's a lymphocyte cell line. Uh, they, we can get amazing synchrony of these cells after we wash out one in MPP1. So we block the cells in G2, and you see we have 96% of the cells are blocked in G2. And then we wash out, and this is minutes after the washout. So within five minutes after the washout, over 80% of the cells are in prophase. And then by 10 minutes, 90% of the cells are in early pro-metaphase. The nuclear envelope is broken down and the chromosomes are assembled and, and so on. So you can see we get this quite incredible synchrony of the cells. This means that we can now study biochemically events that people could previously only just look at by live cell microscopy. But we need to calibrate this system. And one of the things that we need to know is when, do the when does the cytoplasm mix with the DNA? Because it turns out that there's one of the condensin complexes in the cytoplasm, and it's required to form the chromosomes. But we don't know when it gets at the chromosomes. So uh, when does that happen? So that's going to take me to the next little section of my talk, which is uh, unpublished work from our group, uh, from Kamiko. And textbooks could tell you the answer. So textbooks say that access to the nucleus comes when the nuclear envelope breaks down. And here you can see there's a, there's a protein complex called the lamina that surrounds the nucleus. That's, it's actually stained red here. The cytoplasm is pretty small in these cells. Uh, and you can see at one point here, we go from having nice cytoplasm on the outside to having green, uh, having the, the green, uh, the lamina, which uh, spread basically all over. And so that's called nuclear envelope breakdown. But the trouble was, we saw cytoplasmic proteins loading on the DNA before nuclear envelope breakdown. And in fact, turns out the textbooks are wrong. So what happens to the nucleus during mitotic entry? So normally, the nucleus is a double, nu there's a double membrane around the nucleus which separates the chromosomes from the cytosol. Now in metazoans, disassembling of this barrier defines the beginning of prometaphase because that's when chromosomes can start to interact with the spindle structure in the cytoplasm that's going to segregate them. And here, uh, what you're looking at is three GFP molecules tied up together and hooked to a nuclear export sequence. So that holds these, these GFPs in the cytoplasm. If any get into the nucleus, they're exported out to the cytoplasm. But you can see as we look now, as we release our cells from G2 into mitosis, at 10 minutes, you can start to see now this, uh, this, this uh, cytoplasmic components are coming into the nucleus. That tells us the barrier between the nucleus and the cytoplasm is broken down. All right, so now let's look really bit, a little bit more carefully at this process. So we're gonna live image this process in a DT40 cell, and these are one and a half minutes, these, these uh, images are taken one and a half minutes apart. Now here we're looking at the DNA, and you notice it looks like a ring. And in fact, that's true. Yes, chromosomes actually, the, this is, these are the chromosomes that are condensing in early prophase, and that condensation happens on the nuclear envelope, and also these look like they're around something here, and what they're surrounding there is the nucleolus. So chromosome condensation happens on the nuclear envelope and at, around the nucleolus in mitosis. Now, if we take those same cells and we look at the nuclear lamina, this is the intermediate filament network that supports the nuclear envelope, what you can see is the lamina is continuous, 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 and then here we see a break in the lamina. Maybe it's starting to break here, but here it definitely breaks. 
now let's look at that sequence at that uh, probe that we had looking at the barrier between nucleus and cytoplasm. That's shown here. This is three GFP molecules hooked up to, to a nuclear export sequence. And you can see it's excluded from the nucleus, excluded. Now it starts to come into the nucleus. And here it's definitely coming into the nucleus here on the, on the left hand of the second row. Okay, if we put this together, what you see is that the GFP, the, the, the GFP that should be in the cytoplasm starts to leak into the nucleus here. And it's only at least six minutes later that we can see breaks in the nuclear envelope. So that says the nucleus loses its barrier function well before a nuclear envelope breakdown. And in fact, we know that it loses its barrier function at a time when the nuclear pores, which are the, the, the passageways in and out through the, on, uh, through the envelope, become modified by CDK1, our friend the kinase CDK1, and other kinases, and they lose their ability to make a barrier between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Okay. So now we're gonna go uh, and talk a little bit about how proteins move on and off the DNA as chromosomes form. And this is, uh, again, more unpublished work. And so we're gonna map the DNA association of every protein complex during mitotic entry. And this is done by Itaru Samajima, who's a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. And here you see in a human cell, the process, so here is an interface nucleus and as the cell enters prophase, you can see these are the nucleoli, these dark spots. You can see the nucleoli slowly going away. And then the chromosomes forming. Okay, so now Atara wanted to look at this process. And he did this by a process by using a technique called CHEP, which stands for Chromatin Enrichment for Proteomics. And this is related to CHIP, which is chromatin immunoprecipitation, which I'm sure that most of you have heard of. And so the way it starts is just, as, this starts just exactly as that we were doing a chip experiment. So we cross-link the cells in vivo by adding formaldehyde to them. Then we're gonna lyse them with a little bit of mild detergent. That's exa again, exactly what we would do in a chip experiment. And we're gonna spin down the nuclei. So we're gonna basically, this step washes a lot of soluble proteins away, but now we're gonna get pretty drastic. We're gonna digest, well, first we're gonna digest with RNAs to try to get rid of the RNA because we're interested in proteins that can cross-link to DNA. And now we're gonna get drastic and we're gonna add 4% SDS, which is a strong denaturing agent. And then we're gonna mix that with 8 molyurea, which is a different, it's a chaotropic agent, a different strong de uh, denaturing agent. And we're gonna spin. And so our pellet here is no longer nuclei. The nuclei have been completely destroyed our pellet is a little transparent gelatinous pellet, which is the DNA, the chromosomes, and they spin down because they're, the DNA molecules are large, and then cross-linked to them are the proteins that we're cross-linked through with formaldehyde. We're gonna wash that twice by just spinning, resuspending, and spinning, and then we're gonna sonicate it because we actually don't want the DNA. So we're gonna shear the DNA as well as we can, and we're gonna spin again, and so anything that spins down now, we're gonna throw away. And now we're gonna take the supernatant which contained the proteins and we're gonna process those proteins and identify them by mass spectrometry. And so CHEP identifies all the proteins that are close enough to the DNA to be cross-linked to it by formaldehyde. So the experiment is we combine our chemical genetic synchronization of the cells. So we arrest the cells in G2 with one in MPP1, then we wash it out and then in intervals of 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, et cetera, we take samples, we isolate the chromatin, uh, we take samples, we first we cross-link them we, uh, just with formaldehyde, as I just showed you, then we isolate the chromatin, and we get the proteins, we digest them, and we run them on the mass spec. And to analyze all of the various samples that were taken here is something like about five or six months of mass spectrometer time. So this project actually took several years to complete. So the CHEP experiments reproducibly identified 2,000 over about 2,500 proteins that were near, that could be cross-linked to the DNA. But to learn anything from this, we need to, to divide those proteins into groups. So how are we gonna do that? Well, there are a couple of different ways we can do it. So we can explain 80% of the variation in our data set by, by using a, a kind of clustering called K-means clustering, and we can divide them into six clusters. So down here, what is K-means clustering? K-means divides a data set into K groups 
based on how similar the, their, their average behavior is in the CHEP time course. So this enables us to capture big data, uh, to capture big trends in our data. So for example, I'm showing you we, for two replicate experiments, there, we're gonna start, and I'm gonna show you lots of plots like this. We start in G2, then we've washed out the one in MPP1, and then we call that zero, and then we have five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And the, the visible nuclear envelope breakdown happened here at about 10 minutes, and, but the nucleus became permeable earlier. And so what you can see is when, when, uh, when, uh, when the curve goes up, that's proteins that are getting closer to the DNA. When it goes down, that's proteins that are coming off the DNA. And here you see all, the, the, all of the various proteins. Now we can look at the proteins in a different way in a T-SNE map. And so uh, T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding takes a data set with many dimensions uh, and it reduces it to two dimensions and it puts together the proteins that tend to behave similarly. The dimensions in this blot are arbitrary. Uh, and uh, uh, the principal component analysis would be kind of similar, but it tries to take things that are not the same and move them apart. t sneak things, takes things that behave similar and puts them together, and we think it works better. We call this our UK map, so Scotland's up there in the north and England is down here in the south. Okay, now the trouble with, this is a very powerful method, but the trouble is it's, we've divided it into six groups, but they've got hundreds of proteins, and that's too many proteins for us to make sense of it. So we like hierarchical clustering, where we can have a smaller number of clusters, or we have more clusters with fewer proteins in the clusters. And so we can use those clusters uh, and separate them on a T-SNE map. And I like this because Scotland is on an upward trend. So Scotland is the proteins that go up. England is static or going down. And I'm one of the few people who voted for Scottish independence. So I like that Scot Scotland is going upwards. Now, uh, three SMC complexes, which contain condensin and the other uh, and other components that you may have heard of, for example, cohesin, they behave very differently. Condensin goes up on chromosomes as they enter mitosis, cohesin goes down, and the SMC5-6 complex, which is a bit mysterious, doesn't do very much, doesn't change very much. I could talk a lot about that, but that's a subject for another seminar. So I'm just going to talk about one part of one story. And that's disassembly of the nucleolus. So here's a prophase cell. You can see the chromosomes in red, and the nucleolus is still there in green. Well, it turns out that the first events of prophase that we can see are actually taking place in that nucleolus. So even though the nucleolus was still there when the chromosomes looked like they had formed, the nuclear proteins dropped really quickly. And where they are is there, and that's in the toe of England. That's called Cornwall. Uh, and you see that uh, depending, this is two different ways of, of defining the nuclear proteome, and you can see that these proteins go down first. And mature ribosomes be, are, behave quite differently from that. Uh, so these are nuclear proteins where the ribosomes are made, and that's the actual ribosomes, and they behave differently. Now, trans, uh, textbooks say that transcription is shut, off and, uh, is shut off during mitosis. And in fact, if we look at levels of RNA polymerases, you can see they fall. And if we look at TTF2, which is a termination factor for our RNA polymerase 2, it increases. So RNA, two, RNA polymerase 2 transcription is being shut off. And this fits with a hypothesis that I won't have time to tell you about today. But if we look at the levels of an RNA polymerase 1, that's, this is the polymerase that makes ribosomal RNA, its termination factor goes down. So let's look a little bit more carefully. And it turns out that what happens to ribosomal RNA is special. So the violet colored here, the purple colored curves, are the, these are the proteins that process pre-ribosomal RNA as it's synthesized as a large precursor. And you can see they go away really quickly, but the RNA polymerase that's making the RNA stays on. So in fact, what happens is processing stops before the polymerase detacher is, detaches from the chromatin, and pre-ribosomal RNA accumulates, and it ends up, it ends up during later in mitosis, being on the periphery of the chromosomes in this specialized compartment, which is just called the chromosome periphery. Why? We don't know why. We plan to find out. This is one of the things that we're still working on. Uh, but if we look at other aspects of, uh, of transcription and translation, these, these uh, protein, these are dead box helicases called EIF, and the EIF transcription, uh, these EIF dead box helicases, they increase on chromosomes. Now that could just be contamination, but it turns out that one of these components, EIF4A, has recently been able to show, shown to be able to 
suppress phase separation by, ribos by RNAs. You may be familiar with phase separation. We don't know. Maybe this is important for assembly of the chromosomes in their periphery during mitosis. So this is, these are the sorts of things that we're studying now and want to learn more about. So if I summarize these CHEP experiments, proteins change their association with DNA, and there's an orderly pathway during mitotic entry. That's why we could get that UK map. Prophase actually starts. The first things that happen in prophase are nuclear proteins move away from the DNA. There are also changes in the nuclear pores, but I'm not going to show them to you. But those changes of the nuclear pores allow cytoplasmic proteins to enter the nucleus long before you can see any visible evidence of the nuclear envelope changing. Uh, and that corresponds, interestingly, when they enter corresponds with the beginning of when chromosome condensation starts. So we wonder if that's related. Bulk interface chromosome proteins leave the DNA en masse at around the time of nuclear envelope breakdown. And condensin shows complex behaviors, of, uh, and, and that's consistent with its roles in chromosome, chromosome formation, but that's another story. I'm not going to talk about it. Now, at the end of my talk, I'd like to thank my very talented collaborators, Kamiko Samajima, who set up almost all of the experiments I showed you, uh, Itaru Samajima, who did the mass spectrometry together with uh, uh, Gerard Kustacher, who's a postdoc with uh, uh, Yuri Rapsober, Dan Booth, who used to be a postdoc in my lab, who did the electron microscopy that I showed you, and Jan Rupert, who kindly made the movie for us. And I have to thank the Wellcome Trust for their support, because they keep me going in the style to which I would like to become accustomed. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Bill, for your patience, and everybody else for the patience. We had a nice discussion meanwhile, but yeah. we'll still have some little time for questions. If there are more questions, uh, please raise your hand and uh, we'll... Uh... Perhaps the uh, discussion for 10 minutes or 15 minutes there was sufficient. So I don't see any other hands being raised. I think I had my fair share, so. Yeah, I think, I think you did. And I think that people had a more extensive back and forth with you, which is great. So we will move on to the uh, next you. talk then, which is the last talk of this session. Uh, it is going to be given by Basilo Kwesa Human from Johns Hopkins University. And the uh, talk is titled Nucleation and Non-Equilibrium Drives Phase Separation in a Cooperative Kinetic Reaction Diffusion Model. Two, three, four, okay. Hello everyone, my name is Basilio Ciesa and today I'm gonna be talking about a computational project that I have been working very close with Professor Elijah Roberts and Krasan Blago. Uh, where we use a rational diffusion model to understand phase separation. Uh, for people who is not familiar with phase separation, phase separation is a conversion of a single phase system into a multi-phase system. Uh, to understand a little bit more the dynamics of a phase separation system, here we have, for example, protein concentration versus time, and you could see how the concentration of protein increase along the time and then it decrease. When the system cross a critical concentration, the system switch from a diffuse state to a condensate state. As long as the system is above this critical concentration, the droplet form are very stable. And when the total concentration of the system drop and is smaller than the critical concentration, the system switch again from a condensate state to a diffuse state. In this plot, uh, we see exactly the same as the previous one, but the difference is that it's remarking the fact that some uh, post-translation modifications, changing temperatures or ionic strength, can modify the protein interaction or protein affinity so that the critical concentration is going to also change. And in this way, it could be more easy to phase separate. Uh, why are we interested in phase separation? Where well, there are several organelles, and no uh, membraneless organelles that sh shows phase separation look it like properties. Um, for example, we have the pilgranos that show look it like droplets. Uh, we have also the nucleoli, 
and also nuclear bodies. For example, in the pig granules, uh, in this paper, they show that they drop off the surface of the nucleus, like liquid droplets. In the other hand, nucleoli also show liquid like properties because they can coalesce and convert in a bigger droplet. And also nuclear bodies can be induced so that they form a phase separation a nuclear bodies. How are we gonna study this problem? We're gonna use the reaction diffusion master equation. The reason we're gonna use this method is because we want the, to have information about the number of particles in the system, but also we want to know inform, have information about the distribution of particles in the system, as you can see here. Uh, and how are we gonna implement the reaction diffusion master equation? To do this, we're gonna use a software called Lattice Micro, developed by Professor Elijah Roberts in 2013. And the model that we're going to use is a model that consists of two species, X1 and X2. And these species interact through these two kinetic reactions. In the first reaction, X1 and X1 interact to form X2. And then X2 can recruit more X1 to form more X2. Uh, to understand in more detail the model, I'm going to show you the um, the dimension of the system. For example, here we have, this is a typical volume that we use to do the simulation. It's one micrometer by 100 micrometer by 100 micrometer. In this volume, we're gonna simulate the reactions of these two species. And here there are some of the parameters that we use for some of the simulations. So the first question that we wanted to answer is, can this model show phase separation? Uh, now I'm going to show you the results about this question. Here you're going to see the results of one simulation, uh, but I'm going to show you in two screens. The first one corresponds to the species just X1, and the second one to the species X2, but both of them correspond to the same simulation. So the dimensions is 100 by 100 micrometers, and black corresponds to zero particles and white to three particles. So what we found is that, interestingly, X1 uh, doesn't form cluster, but X2 does form cluster. So from this simulation, we conclude that we have developed a new model that shows phase separation through cluster information. Obviously, the previous simulation showed you the result for one specific condition. So we were wondering what's going to happen to this system when we start to change some of the parameters, like for example, the nucleation rate or K1. You can see how we, gave, we changed in two order of magnitudes. Here you could see uh, the species X2. You could see the clusters, how they are very noisy, not as well defined as previously. And here you could see other conditions where the clusters are better defined than the previous one, but they are still very dynamic. They can share particles. But here in the last one, you could see how these clusters are very condensed and very stable along the time. So if we continue changing this parameter, we intuit that we're going to see more uh, uh, conformations or more dynamics of the clusters. So we did a phase diagram to study uh, the space. And here you have K1 versus K3. Uh, the reason we use these two parameters is because K1 uh, corresponds to the nucleation frequency and K3 to the cooperativity strength. And the parameter phi gives us information about the gradient of the clustering in this space. For example, we see different regions with different gradient or with different degree of clustering uh, in different colors. And for example, here in B, you could see a region in the space where basically there is no clustering. But then when you move to the region in C, you can see regions where you're gonna see many clusters. They are very stable. They share particles very slowly. But there is other, other region where the clusters are bigger. They are much more dynamic. They share particles. They never equilibrate in a, they never equilibrate to a huge cluster. They always keep moving along the surface. And finally, we found regions where uh, all the particles collapse in a huge cluster. So from this analysis, we can conclude that clusters show different dynamics and size depending on the nucleation rate and the cooperativity strength. So the next question that we were wondering is, does phase separations occur in or out of equilibrium or both? 
So to, to do this analysis, we did a detail balance analysis that state that in equilibrium, the flux of particles in X1, the flux of particles, sorry, from left to right should be equal to the flux of particles from right to left in each direction, which is expressed in this exp mathematical expression where you have the J correspond to the flux of particles plus correspond to the direction particle from left to right and minus correspond to the direction right to left. And I correspond to the reaction, first reaction and second reaction. So when we apply this relation to our system, we identify this mathematical relation where K2 times K3 divided by K1 times K4 is equal to one. This is the condition that should be satisfied for the system to be in equilibrium. What it means the phase separation occur in equilibrium when two, the equation two is satisfied. Otherwise, the system is out of equilibrium. So then what we did to see the system is in equilibrium or out of equilibrium, we plot K2 versus K3, which you could see here uh, correspond to these parameters, and we could fix K1 and K4. And we identify a region where the clustering happening. I mean, the system is switching in this region, inside this region from a diffuse state to a condensate state. But outside this region, the system is always in just one state, a diffuse state. So to see if this is happening in equilibrium or out of equilibrium, we calculate the difference in chemical potential. And you could see that to be in the equilibrium, this difference should be zero, which corresponds to the white color and should be along this line. But the uh, region where we see clustering is far away from this region. And you can see that the difference of chemical potential is around 20, which uh, support the fact that phase separation in our system occur out of equilibrium. Now, uh, the next question that we were wondering is, does nucleation promote phase separation? Uh, the reason we are interested in this is because there are two previous works uh, where they inserted in the first one, for example, they inserted a small DNA sequence of 12 8 pair. And in the location when they inserted this sequence, they promote the formation of clustering. And in the second work, they did exactly the same work, but instead of a DNA sequence, they use a, a protein, a master transcription, master regulator transcription factor. And what they found is that when they also include this small protein, they also favor the formation of clustering. So what we Thing is that maybe if we imagine the system as a system of two state when we have the diffuse state and the condensate state and they are separated by a, a barrier, maybe the nucleation can decrease this barrier, allowing us to see the condensate state in other regions of the space that we were not able in the previous uh, plot. So how we implemented the nucleation side? What we did is we use the same equations that previously I showed you, showed you. But this time we inserted a new third equation, which basically, as you could see, is the same that the second one. The only difference is that this X2 star particle has a diffusion coefficient of zero. But it's exactly the same that this particle. So these particles X2 star can promote, can do exactly the same reaction as the previous one, but these particles are fixing in space. What I mean with this, if we go to this volume, we're gonna locate these X2 particles, these X star particles in this location, they has a diffusion coefficient of zero, and then we're gonna load that X1 particles to equilibrate. And what we found is that now we can test the effect of thin nucleation size on phase separation. And this is the previous diagram that I showed you, where we don't have any fixed nucleation site, K1 versus K3. And when we include the fixed nucleation site, you could see that now a region that previously didn't show clustering, now is showing clustering or phase separation. So from here, we can conclude that fixed nucleation sites promote phase separation. So in conclusion, uh, we have developed a new model that shows phase separation. Uh, clusters show different dynamic size depending on the parameters, in this case, K1, the nucleation rate, and K3, the cooperativity strain. And also in our model, clustering occurs out of equilibrium. 
as we saw with the calculator differing of chemical potential. And finally, thick nucleation sites promote phase separation or clustering in our system. So with this, I would like to thank to Professor Tayeha for his mentoring, uh, mostly to Professor Elijah Roberts and Krastan Blago, who trained me and mentoring me a lot during this project, trained me in mathematical modeling and computational simulation. And also to Dr. Sua Mion, who we with who we has really excited and interesting discussion about phase separation and also all the HALA members. Thank you. I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. That was a very nice talk. Uh, we have time for questions. The first question is from uh, Natalia Kochanova. Please go ahead. Um, hi, uh, I wanted to ask, did you by chance include the multivalency of interactions into your model? And uh, did you check whether it also promotes phase separation in your setup? Thanks. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, no, we didn't include a multivalence. Uh, we just include the uh, nucleation frequency in the first reaction and uh, a cooperativity strain in the second reaction. And the, then we have a, another question from Suchio Shin. Hi, um, I'm wondering um, if your model, um, if your model also mimics the the you know, the coalescence um, as the experiment rebuilt because um, um, I'm wondering your, you know, one of your parameters is related with the cooperativity. Is it just the kinetic things? It's not related with interactions to mimic the, you know, surface tension to give rise to the, the coalescence effect of the droplets? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, we, the, is uh, depending on the region of the phase space where you are, we saw regions where the clusters collapse. I mean, the dynamics start with, let's say, 10 or 20 small clusters. And along the time, they start to collapse and they form a huge cluster. However, uh, we don't see a, like a qualens uh, phenomenon, like, for example, uh, in the first talk, Professor uh, Rosen show. What we saw is like, looks like that one cluster is, they interchange particles. And depending on the size of the clusters, uh, the bigger clusters start to recruit more particles from the other cluster till it collapses to a huge one. But we were not able yet to see two clusters coalescing together and forming a one huge cluster. Any other questions? Uh, Natalia, do you have another question? No, okay, so very good. Thank you, thank you for your talk uh, and uh, thank you to all the speakers for the talk in this session. Thank you.